the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. What, according to Jeff Foxworthy, are a redneck's most famous last words? Y'all watch this. You know how it goes. A bunch of guys are hanging around. It's almost always men. Seldom does this happen with women. Overconsumption of alcohol is usually involved. And one guy will say something like this. Man, that professional bull riding boys are sure brave, I'll tell you what. Ain't no one brave enough to jump Farmer Johnson's fence and ride his bull. If anyone was that brave, Sean, it'd be you, but ain't no one that brave. And then Sean will say, oh yeah, y'all watch this. <laughs> Our Lord tells us no one can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Fallen humanity hears these words and says, Oh yeah? Watch this. Lutheran liturgical scholar Fred Lindemann writes, The Christian may make no compromises with the world, nor serve God a little and nibble at worldly things. And again, man only has one heart. And if he fills it with worldly cares, he will leave no room in it for God. But that doesn't stop us from trying. The longer I work for the government, the more I see the truth of this statement. The working definition of stupid is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. So it is with people. In the back of their minds, they keep saying, if I really try hard enough, I'll get it right this time. I'll show them this will work for me because I am so special. And why do we do it? Could it be that we really don't trust God? Could it be that I think his word sounds great in church, but doesn't really work out there in the real world. So we keep doing the same thing and expecting different results. We think we can serve both God and money if we just try hard enough, but it never does work. Our Lord wasn't speaking the words of today's gospel to pagans. The Sermon on the Mount was spoken to his disciples. The crowds just happened to be there listening along. The Savior declares, Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life. Body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food, clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not worth more than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They need Even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Notice. He said, O oh, you of little faith. Little faith isn't no faith. Lindemann writes, faith and anxiety cannot live together. For faith does not cast out anxiety. Faith. 
Christ was and is speaking to Christians. Unbelievers are one master. And strictly speaking, it isn't even mammon. All people serve themselves. That includes the fallen part of Christians, too. Oh yeah, we want to play along. As Dr. Gary Zeroff of Concordia Theological Seminary in Fort Wayne says, we love to make offerings to ourselves. So, why do Christians try to serve two masters? Could it be because we look at the fallen world and it looks to us like they have the good stuff? It looks to us like they're winning? And the results are disastrous for the church. Visible Christianity is absolutely clogged with preachers who promise their followers health and wealth in Jesus' name. Christians flock to preachers who tell them they can serve both God and mammon. They flock to preachers who tell them God wants them to be rich. They flock to preachers who tells them that Christ is a winner, and if they accept him as their personal savior, he can make them winners too. Theologian John Piper says, the great tragedy of prosperity preaching is that a person doesn't have to be spiritually awakened to embrace it. One just needs to be greedy. I suppose I could be such a preacher, Except if I did, I'd be unfaithful to my ordination vows. Lindemann writes, On the past two Sundays, we learned that the Christian service to be true and laudable must be the service of love and purity. Today we learn that it must be marked also by singleness of heart, aim, and purpose. A double or divided service is impossible. So, what do we do with those whose service is divided? What do we do with those Christians who try to serve both God and mammon? What are we to do with double-minded people? Well, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to keep on preaching Christ and Him crucified and His law and gospel just as I vowed I would do when I was ordained 11 years ago. And we're to call the double-minded to repentance. After all, Christ died and rose for them. He offers mercy and forgiveness for the sin of trying to serve both God and mammon. And if you've been trying to serve two masters, or even been considering it, you also have a chance to repent. I mean, here we are, close to several restaurants, several shopping centers, and a mall. Have you been daydreaming all through the sermon about where you're going to go for after church lunch? Have you been having your eye on that cute little outfit that you can't exactly afford right now? Or maybe you're doing the mental math of how you'll spend your winnings once you score that winning lottery ticket, there is forgiveness for you too. Jesus says, Therefore do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your Heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. And why should we? Because our master was single-minded in his devotion to us. Look at the birds of the air. They neither reap, nor sow, nor gather into barns. And yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more of more worth than they? So said the one who was given vinegar to drink, 
when he said from the cross, I thirst. Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in, his in all his glory was not arrayed as one of these. So said the one who was beaten, dressed in a purple robe and a crown of thorns, then stripped and nailed to the cross. And speaking of manna, many years ago, my brother completed his army basic training at Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri. To celebrate, he went to a local tattoo parlor outside the army base and got his first ink. I was there with him, and as I was waiting, I looked at the designs on offer and found one I liked. Not loved, liked. A Tasmanian devil playing a marching snare drum. Then I looked at the price, 120 bucks or something like that. And it didn't take me long to think of a lot of things I'd rather spend that kind of mammon on. But you, my friends, are engraved in the palms of your Savior's hands. And it cost him something much more than 120 bucks. Indeed, it cost him something much more precious than all the gold and treasures in Fort Knox. It cost his life and every drop of his precious blood. Christ didn't come to be a winner. He didn't come to make us winners either. He came to be the biggest loser of all, losing his very life. And his followers can expect to be losers too. But in the end, we will be more than conquerors. How do we know this? Because on Easter Sunday, Christ rose from the dead. In holy baptism, our risen Savior has clothed, him, clothed us with himself, our robe of righteousness, covering all our sins. That's why it's been customary since the earliest days of the church for the newly baptized to be clothed in white garments. And he feeds us with his precious body and blood in the bread and wine of the Lord's Supper. And all these things, earthly things that is, what the Lord's Prayer calls daily bread, shall be added to you. So, can't we trust God? Y'all watch this. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We stand.